Well, hello and welcome back to our Bible study here coming from Campbellsville Baptist Church at 420 North Central Avenue in Campbellsville, Kentucky. Uh, my name is Dr. Terry Wilder and my pastor uh, here at uh, Campbellsville Baptist Church is Dr. Dwayne Norman. And we would like to invite you to attend our, uh, our Sunday services or our Wednesday night service. Uh, we would love to have you come and visit. We'd like to get to know you. We'd like to encourage you in your walk with uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, our Sunday school starts on Sunday mornings at 9.15 a.m. Our morning worship on Sunday is at 10.30 a.m. and our evening worship is at 6 p.m. On Wednesday evenings, we have Bible studies and prayer meeting at uh, 6 p.m. So uh, we would be honored to have you visit us and join us on one of those days or more. Well, we've been going through a survey of the New Testament, devoting a little bit of time to each biblical book. And now we're in the home stretch. We, uh, today we'll look at the book of Revelation. And uh, so before we start, let's uh, pray. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you that salvation comes only through him and no other way. Lord, thank you for Christ's death on the cross uh, on our behalf. Thank you that he took upon himself our iniquities. He paid our sin debt and atoned for our sins when we ourselves could not. Lord, we're grateful for salvation through Jesus. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful that, that uh, through your word we know you, the God of the scriptures, better. Father, we thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We pray, Father, that as we learn more and more about the, each biblical book and as we come to know you more, that we might use this knowledge in the service of Christ, in the service of the church, advancing the gospel together, equipping the church so that others might engage in advancing the gospel with us. Lord, we give you great praise and honor and glory for who you are, again, and what you've done for us in Christ. Guide our study now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are ready for the book of Revelation this week. I wish we could do a full-blown study of uh, Revelation, but uh, we need to finish out this uh, survey. Perhaps we could do something like that uh, in the future. But uh, we are studying today the book of Revelation, giving you a brief introduction to it. Uh, notice, uh, and this is one of my pet peeves, I guess, it is one revelation, the revelation. Uh, it's not revelations, as I hear people uh, call it from uh, time to time. So one revelation given to John. Uh, so as far as the title of the book, it is The Revelation. Um, and it, we see in verse 1 that this is the revelation given to John. But it's not revelation about John or from John per se. We see in verse 1 also that it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, so uh, is this revelation from Christ? In other words, given to Christ who in turn gave it to us. Uh, through John, or is it revelation about Christ or concerning Christ? Yes, I think it uh, is uh, both. It's what uh, I think we would call a plenary genitive. Uh, but uh, so it's one revelation given to uh, John through Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him gave Christ to show to his bondservants the things must, which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So there we see in verses 1 and 2, revelation given to John, revelation from Christ, revelation concerning Christ. The book of Revelation contains apocalyptic material. Uh, apocalyptic uh, material is a flourishing form of literature uh, from uh, the time of the intertestamental Judaism. But, uh, and so the Revelation is a lot like that material. It relates a lot of end time type uh, events and so forth. But 
That even being the case, though, the Revelation, Revelation maintains some distinctions from those other writings that were present in intertestamental Judaism. Uh, for instance, the Revelation is heavily prophetic. We see that, for instance, in verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. In other words, Revelation is prophecy. And heeds the things which are written in it, for the time is near. But Revelation also emphasizes morality. You can get a, a, an inkling of this in Revelation chapter 2 and verses 15 and 16, where John, as he writes to the church at Pergamum, as he relays the words of Christ, it uh, tells the, uh, the church at uh, uh, Pergamum, so you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were a, a very immoral, libertine type of a group. And uh, Christ tells the church through John, therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. So uh, a heavy emphasis on morality, heavily prophetic, it emphasizes morality. Now, uh, normally, apocalyptic literature is uh, pseudonymous. In other words, it's written under a false name. For instance, uh, you might have somebody who's not very well known, and they write under the name of, uh, let's say, uh, the Apostle John, or they write under the name of the Apostle Paul, uh, using their names as a pseudonym, typically to give their, their writing uh, an authority that they themselves do not possess. But I would argue, of course, that Revelation is not pseudonymous. It's written by John, according to our text here in verse 1. Usually, uh, apocalyptic literature is pessimistic. And yet, uh, the Revelation is not pessimistic per se. It's realistic and it's optimistic uh, even. Uh, apocalyptic uh, literature in general uh, is usually interpreted by angels uh, in its entirety. You only have that occasionally in Revelation. Um, so uh, this Revelation also anticipates Messiah, and uh, Revelation looks at the historical basis of the coming of the Messiah. So this apocalyptic um, uh, literature from intertestamental Judaism anticipates the Messiah, but Revelation looks at the historical basis of the coming of the Messiah. So that's just some similarities and some distinctives between apocalyptic literature that we find in intertestamental Judaism and also the Revelation. So um, we can see that uh, Revelation, as far as its genre, uh, is apocalyptic. It is an apocalypse. It's prophecy. Uh, we saw that in verse 3. But it's also a letter because uh, this uh, letter is written to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and we'll get into that here in a moment. Well, our author is uh, simply referred to as John, uh, as a bondservant. He's referred to as a bondservant here in verse 1. Christ gives the revelation to John. He communicates it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testifies to the word and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Uh, there are some people who say that this, this is just simply a John, and they don't uh, uh, attach any specificity to that. But I think it's John the Apostle. And the reason I say that uh, is because the early church had virtually unanimous testimony that John the Apostle wrote this, uh, uh, this book. For instance, we have uh, Justin in his dialogues, uh, he's on the scene right around uh, A.D. 150, and he attributes uh, the authorship of Revelation to John the Apostle. Also, there is uh, a, a bishop uh, known as Melito. Uh, you spell his name M-E-L-I-T-T-O, Melito. He is bishop of Sardis right around A.D. 165. He's quoted in Eusebius' church history in Book 4, uh, verse uh, uh, section 26 and verse 2. 
And uh, it's important to note that uh, Sardis is one of the churches addressed in Revelation chapter 3. And here you have the bishop of Sardis uh, in AD 165 who, uh, who attributes the book to the apostle John. Also, right around A.D. 180, you have a fellow by the name of Irenaeus, I-R-E-N-A-E-U-S, Irenaeus. And Irenaeus, in his book Against Heresies, for instance, in Book 3, Section 11 and Verse 1, uh, he attributes um, John the Apostle as being the author of the Revelation. Uh, Irenaeus knew a man by the name of Polycarp. So when he was a boy, he knew Polycarp, and uh, he says that, uh, and he would have been discipled by Polycarp. Well, Polycarp uh, was uh, was discipled by the apostle John, and so you have Polycarp, who's a disciple of the apostle John, and you have Irenaeus, who is a who knew Polycarp. Um, he knew Polycarp uh, when he was a boy, and uh, he uh, would have uh, spent time with Polycarp and no doubt had been discipled by Polycarp as well. So you got Justin, you've got Melito, you've got Irenaeus, who all attribute the revelation to the Apostle John. Uh, also, you have the Muratorian Canon, which is a canon of Scripture that was circulating in the second century that attributes... Um, Revelation to John the Apostle. Uh, so uh, from all that we know about this, uh, the author of Revelation, it points to the Apostle John. His name is John. This man is very well versed in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the churches uh, of uh, Asia, the seven churches, attribute uh, authorship to, to John. Uh, there are similarities between um, Revelation and the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John. Uh, they have common ideas and common theology, uh, common words, uh, the use of uh, antitheses, uh, you know, like light and darkness, truth and falsehood, the power of God, the power of this world. Uh, there are uh, similarities in, uh, in vocabulary. For instance, they both use the word logos, uh, you know, word, uh, for instance, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we see also in Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, where the word uh, word is used. Uh, and there it says, uh, He has clothed the robe, dipped in blood, and His name is called the Word of God, a reference to, to Jesus. So there are a lot of common Ideas, common theology, common vocabulary. Lamb is another, the Lamb of God. Uh, and uh, a lot of similarities uh, in style of uh, writing as well. So uh, I, I don't think I need to spend a whole, whole lot of time on that. I mean, authorship discussions can get very involved. But uh, the, the one who writes this, uh, this book, and it is a letter, and it is a prophecy, and it is an apocalypse, is the Apostle John. Uh, this book deals with the glorified Christ. And uh, so uh, this is uh, well worth our while for study. As far as the background of the book, uh, I think that uh, uh, I, I want to discuss this a little bit. Uh, at this point in time, uh, you have an emperor who uh, plays an important part. And uh, the background of the, of the book, as I see it, is that uh, you have an, an imperial cult. Uh, in other words, uh, you have a, uh, an emperor who has uh, his followers, the imperial cult. And I think we find in Revelation a key contrastive illusion between what we call a pantocrator. Now that's a Greek word that means the Almighty, the Almighty One. And the emperor at the time, although this word isn't used uh, in Revelation, as far as the background is uh, concerned though, that uh, you know, there is an emperor on the throne and he is known as an autocrator. 
So you have a Pantocrator and an Autocrator. So with this imperial cult, there's your key contrast of illusion. Jesus Christ is the Pantocrator, the Almighty One. At this point in time, one of the Roman Caesars, we'll talk about that in a bit, is, is the, uh, uh, the Autocrator. So uh, the Autocrator, the Pantocrator, the Pantocrator trumps the Autocrator. And uh, if you have followers of the emperor, if you have the emperor who's demanding allegiance to himself, and you have believers in Jesus who are following the Lord Jesus Christ, the Almighty One, that's going to lead to some persecution. That's going to lead to some uh, ideological uh, frictions, if you uh, will. Uh, so we, we have this key contrast of illusion in the background, as far as the background of the book is concerned, the Pantocrator and the Autocrator. As I mentioned, the word the Pantocrator is translated as the Almighty or the Almighty One. We can see that, for instance, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. Uh, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God decrees, the one who is and the one who was and the one who is coming, the Pantocrator. Uh, we also have an acclamation in Revelation 4, verse 8. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Pantocrator, in other words, the Almighty One, the One who was and the One who is and the One who comes. We have a thanksgiving in Revelation chapter 11, verse 17. The Lord God, the Pantocrator, the Almighty One, the One who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and you have reigned. Or in Revelation chapter 15 and verse 3, we have the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Again, a reference to the Lord God, the Pantocrator. You have a, an acclamation in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 7. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6. Yes, Lord God, the Pantocrator. Um, and there are all sorts of references to the Pantocrator throughout the book of Revelation. Revelation 21, 22. And I did not see a temple in it, referring to the city, in it, for the Lord God, the Pantocrator, and the Lamb is its temple. So uh, Revelation 16, 14 talks about the great day of God, the Pantocrator. Revelation 19, 15 talks about the wrath of God, the Pantocrator. So uh, that word occurs throughout Revelation. And again, we have in the background here, there is a Roman Caesar who is on the throne. We'll talk about who that may be here in a bit. He's known as an autocrator. Now, he's an emperor. And, and usually, uh, this, uh, this title was given to the, a, a victorious general for a year. But later on, it was transferred to being the title of the emperor so that it became almost like part of his name. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the Roman uh, emperors, Domitian, uh, he had up to like 26 epithets or titles or names referring to himself. We do have evidence for an imperial cult, in other words, emperor worship uh, in Asia uh, here uh, at, at this point in time. Uh, and uh, there were several early temples in the east that grew out of the deification of uh, these uh, emperors. For instance, in Smyrna, there was a temple uh, built in 27 BC. There was one in Ephesus built in 6 BC. There was one in Pergamum built in AD 19. So this, this whole imperial cult, this cult of Roma, the cult of the emperor, um, it was viewed as a symbol of loyalty to the Roman state. Uh, emperors were deified. They were treated as God in the East after the death of uh, each particular emperor. And one cult that we know of, for instance, uh, the Domitian's recult, uh, his cult, uh, was known at Ephesus. Uh, he uh, was very well liked at Ephesus. He had spent a lot of uh, money and was a benefactor to Ephesus more than any other previous uh, emperor. But uh, he had a, a cult at Ephesus uh, and connected with this imperial cult is, um, is uh, the deification of these, uh, these emperors. Well, that leads to an inevitable conflict. Uh, we have evidence of uh, repression under the emperor Domitian. Uh, we have uh, evidence where the, uh, 
uh, Christians were expelled, you know, out of uh, uh, the various uh, cities uh, by uh, antagonistic Jews, Jews who were officially, uh, unofficially rather, exempted from emperor worship. Uh, so uh, I say all that. You can study more on that if you would like. Uh, you know, don't just take my word for it. Look it up. Uh, but uh, so you've got a background here where there is the, the cult of the emperor, an imperial cult where um, the emperor uh, requires worship of, uh, of himself, this, uh, this cult. Now, as, when we come to Revelation, we, we always have to talk about uh, date, the date. Um, the date of the book of Revelation is going to be closely connected with the identification of the persecution that we find in Revelation. For instance, uh, there's persecution by Nero. These are really the only two choices we have as far as the dating of a revolution. There's a persecution by Nero in A.D. 64 to 67, but that persecution is primarily local to Rome, to just Rome itself. But then we have a persecution under the emperor Domitian. Uh, that's from A.D. 91 to 96. And um, I would argue that uh, that Revelation was written within that time frame, A.D. 91 to 96, probably around 95 or 96, under the persecution of Domitian, this Roman emperor. Those who argue for a date under Nero, they will identify the sixth king listed in Revelation as uh, as a Nero. Uh, that is, if you regard Julius Caesar as the first emperor, I mean, that view is possible. They also will take the identification of uh, this number in Revelation 13, 18, 666. Uh, they will uh, view that as referring to Nero. They use a practice known as gematria, G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A, -E gematria, uh, to uh, to transliterate um, th this uh, this number to Aramaic, and then they'll add letters to it, and they come up with the name of uh, uh, Nero. Um, so I, I don't particularly buy that uh, because uh, you know if you just mess with something long enough, uh, I think all this proves that you can uh, come up with just about anything. Also, there are supposed references to presiege. Jerusalem, uh, pre-siege conditions in Jerusalem in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1, or shortly uh, thereafter. Uh, remember that the Romans destroyed uh, Jerusalem in A.D. 70. The temple was uh, destroyed as uh, well. And uh, so some scholars uh, date this book shortly after Nero's death. Um, some date it within Nero's uh, uh, persecution while Nero is still on the throne. So uh, there you have the arguments for a date under Nero, A.D. 64 to 67. The problem with that, though, is, uh, and this is a major objection, is that early church tradition is against that, uh, that, uh, that Nero was the, the emperor, that this, uh, the events in Revelation took place under the persecution of uh, Nero. The arguments for a date under Domitian, the other emperor, uh, are uh, as follows. The, the, the churches of Asia, those churches listed in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, have a considerable history behind them. Uh, and uh, so they've been around for several years. Also, you have more universal persecution under Domitian than you did uh, Nero. And then uh, the worship of the beast that is mentioned in Revelation may be alluding to emperor worship. And um, by the time of Domitian, emperor worship really is in, uh, I think, full, uh, full swing. You know, the imperial cult at this uh, time in Asia uh, appears to be gaining power and directly threatens the readers of this uh, book. And so that situation that we find in the book better fits uh, a date in the 90s, and I would date it somewhere around A.D. 95 to 96. Early tradi church tradition favors a view that uh, occurs uh, that the, the events in this book occur under, occur under Domitian, 
For instance, I mentioned Irenaeus, uh, this disciple of Polycarp, who in turn was a disciple of the Apostle John. He has written a book called Against Heresies. In book 5, section 30 and verse 3, he says this, uh, It was seen no such long time ago, but almost in our own generation, at the end of the reign of Domitian. So he places Revelation in the time of Domitian. So there we have a number of uh, things to, uh, to, uh, that you have to be familiar with in order if you're going to study uh, Revelation. When you come to Revelation, there are all sorts of approaches to this book. I mean, there really are. There's uh, something like three or four different approaches. Um, so I want to um, convey some of these to, to help us to understand that this is something else you're going to have to deal with if you're going to do some advanced study in Revelation. Um, it's difficult to understand uh, Revelation, and there are various approaches to Revelation. Uh, one view is known as the preterist view. And uh, those who follow the preterist view believe that Revelation was written primarily to the period of time in which it was written, in other words, in the first century. They maintain that John described the coming struggle between the church and the Roman government. And so they're going to limit any historical references in Revelation uh, to the first century. The, the strength of that approach is that it makes the message of Revelation relevant relevant to the life situation of the early church. And its limitation, however, is that it is somewhat unable to find a significant message for the church beyond the first century, except by glancing at God's actions in the first century church and assuming that he might repeat the same pattern in the contemporary church. So that's one approach, the preterist approach. You also have the historicist approach. Historicist interpreters regard Revelation as a continuous chronicle of church history from apostolic times until Christ's return. And those who interpret Revelation like this uh, believe that opening the seals, blasting the trumpets, and pouring out the bowls the, these judgments that we find in Revelation represent different events in world and church history. The strength of that viewpoint is that it gives readers a strong impression of the sovereignty of God in world events. But its weakness, its weakness is its subjectivity. Uh, even the uh, historicist interpreters can't agree amongst themselves. There's widespread disagreement uh, amongst them. Uh, there's a variety of interpretations in their efforts to relate the symbols of Revelation to world events. There's also another view known as the futurist view. They approach Revelation with the understanding that the bulk of its content refers to the future actions of God in history. Futurists accept the fact that Revelation grew out of the pressures of the first century, but they insist that Revelation chapters 4 through 22 refers to events leading up to Christ's return, the coming of Christ's kingdom, the final judgment, and also the eternal state. So there are several interpretive approaches that can be identified amongst the futurists. For instance, futurists disagree about when the church will be removed from the earth, either during a secret return of Christ, known as the rapture, or they'll be left on the earth to face, the church will be left on the earth to face the judgment of the tribulation. So the futurist approach. The strength of that is uh, it does have an emphasis on the progressive activity of God in world history, uh, particularly in the future. But a major limitation of the futurist view is that it leaves the original hearers of Revelation with a limited message of encouragement. So in other words, how can the original hearers receive much encouragement from having information about the return of Christ at least 2,000 years into the future? So the interpreters... Ter, uh, the uh, preterist approach, the historicist approach, the futurist approach. We're going to have to wait till next time for the next approach, and that would be the idealist approach. So uh, until next time, uh, you take care and uh, God bless. Let's pray. Father, increase our understanding, we pray, as we study this book of uh, Revelation. Father, increase our faith. Uh, thank you, Lord, that the revelation is about Jesus Christ, and it shows that Christ ultimately triumphs. In the end, he's going to win, and we're grateful for that. 
Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So you take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye now.